Greetings to all of you in Berkeley and around the world, and welcome to another of our Institute for South Asia Studies webinars that we've been carrying on this year during the pandemic. Today, we have an extraordinary program for you uh, on the Voices from the Many Mahabharatas project, a wonderful project of a, growing out of a conference and now a soon to be published book organized and edited by uh, Sohini Sarah Pillai, one of our graduate students, and Nell Hawley, a uh, Sanskrit professor at Harvard University. Uh, let me just uh, remind the audience of uh, a few housekeeping details. We're going to be uh, introducing in individuals and then later groups of participants as we move along through the uh, hour and a half uh, session. Um, at the end of which there will be opportunity for questions and answers on the part of the audience. If you wish to uh, ask a question, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, not the chat tab, and we will have the panelists uh, respond to your questions uh, accordingly. So I'm going to be introducing now the uh, one of the organizers of the uh, session, one of the organizers of this little mini conference, I, I suppose we could call it, uh, who is uh, our very own uh, Sohini Sara Pillai. She is a, an advanced graduate student in South and Southeast Studies, Southeast Asian Studies here in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies at the University of California at Berkeley. And she is currently working on a, a very fascinating dissertation project which bears very closely on the kind of work we're going to be seeing uh, recorded today. And that is a, a study of two Mahabharata versions, one from the Hindi speaking or Bhasha speaking worlds, uh, Chohan's uh, Mahabharata, and a Tamil uh, version of the Mahabharata uh, by uh, a Tamil author called the Paratam, right? Vili, Viliputtar, I think his name. And, um, this is part of this effort that the uh, young scholars, Sohini and Nell have been uh, organizing about looking into the vernacular, if you like, or regional uh, Mahabharatas and how they are impact the development of uh, religious studies and literary studies in uh, early and pre-modern India. So with that, I would like to call upon uh, Sohini to join us on the virtual stage, if you would, and to make some introductory remarks. So please welcome uh, Sohin Niji, and I will vanish temporarily here. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks so much. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Sohini Pillay, and along with Nell Hawley, I'm one of the co-editors of Many Mahabharatas. Uh, Many Mahabharatas will be released from State University of New York, or SUNY Press, on May 1st of this year. And I'm also really happy to announce that the South Asian edition of Many Mahabharatas will be released from Primus Books in Delhi in India. So in a few minutes, Nell and I will attempt to provide uh, brief summaries of the 18 different chapters of this volume. But first I would like to take the opportunity to thank some people. Let me start off by thanking all of you for making the time to be here with us today. Nell and I must express our deepest gratitude to the Institute of South Asia Studies at UC Berkeley for hosting this event, especially to the Institute Director, Dr. Munas Faruqi for his overall enthusiasm and to the Institute's Program Director, Punita Kala, who made this all possible. I'm so pleased that this event can take place at my home institution of UC Berkeley. And I'd like to give a special shout out to all the faculty and students in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies or SEAS who have been an incredible support team to me throughout the past six years. Nell and I are also immensely grateful to C's alum, Dr. Hannah Archimbolt, who created the index for this 437 page book. Nell and I would also like to thank our supervisors and advisors, our friends, our family, especially our parents, and our whole editorial and production team um, at SUNY. Um, Punita, I'm unable to share my screen, uh, if you could 
change that. Um, but let me um, start by saying um, that many Mahabharatas is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Anne Elizabeth Monius, who was professor of South Asian religions at Harvard Divinity School. This book, as Bob mentioned, um, it's the result of the enthusiasm we encountered when we began to organize a many Mahabharata's symposium as part of the annual conference on South Asia in Madison, Wisconsin in October of 2017. The very first person to offer her unconditional support for this project was our beloved mentor, Anne. Anne played an integral role in many Mahabharata's journey from idea to symposium to book. As a respondent for all 14 of the presentations at the Madison Symposium, she offered insightful comments and questions that framed the book as a whole and that helped develop many of the individual chapters within it. Her careful editorial eye helped us to refine the argument and broaden the scope of our book proposal and months later, our introductory chapter. Anne unexpectedly passed away on August 3rd, 2019. She was only 54 years old. Thus, we dedicate this volume to her memory. Thank you, Anne, we miss you. So Nell specifically requested that I not thank her, but too bad, Nell. Um, Nell, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me just say here that I could not have done any of this without you. And finally, Nell and I would like to thank all of the contributing authors of many Mahabharatas for their truly outstanding essays. We are fortunate enough today to be joined by the majority of the authors of many Mahabharatas, along with Bob Goldman and Sally Sutherland Goldman, who graciously agreed to be part of the main event today. We will be joined for the Q&A portion of the book talk by Amanda Culp, Ava de Klerk, David Gittimer, Harshita Murthinthi Kamath, Sucheta Kanjilal, Shudipto Kobiraj, uh, Timothy Lorndale, Philip Leckendorf, Ahona Panda, Heidi Powells, Paula Richman, and Simon Winot. Uh, they will be available to answer any questions anyone in the audience might have about their specific chapters. And now I'd like to invite Nell, Bob, and Sally to join me on screen. Voila. All right, I think it's my turn. Thank you so much, Sohini. Uh, and thanks especially to Punita and Munis and the Institute for South Asia Studies for hosting this event. It's an honor to be here in such good company uh, with my co-panelists, Sally Sutherland Goldman, Bob Goldman, and of course the indomitable Sohini, to whom I extend my most heartfelt thanks in return. I'm thrilled that we have with us so many authors from many Mahabharatas the most rewarding part of this project has been the experience of working with all of you. And I know we're all looking forward to hearing much more from you later in the event. It's been said that the Mahabharata can cast an air of divisiveness on the house it is brought into, but so far our scholarly house has managed to escape the curse. Quite to the contrary, the uh, epic has brought us together. As I see it, the subject is so vast, so complex, and so important that it can or perhaps should be taken on only by a community of minds and hands that is as geographically and intellectually expansive as the world of the Mahabharata itself. I sincerely hope that our circle grows and that we continue to collaborate in the coming years. I think the field of Mahabharata studies will be all the more verdant for it. As we prepare to hail the diversity of Mahabharata literature in South Asia, let us remember that we are hardly the first to do so. Sohini and I chose to open the book with this verse, and I will share my screen. This verse by the Telugu poet, Nannaya, writing in the 11th century. And this is what Nanaya's royal patron says to the poet when he asks him to compose a Mahabharata in Telugu. He says, those who hear Mahabharata in many languages, in many styles, from many tellers, always wanting these stories, all the rewards of many offerings will forever be theirs. This verse captures two guiding principles of our volume. First, that there are real rewards to be gained from coming to know many Mahabharatas in different languages and styles and told in different voices. The multiplicity allows for a special kind of learning, maybe a deeper kind of learning than we would otherwise have. More on that in a bit. 
Second, there's the role that desire plays in all this, always wanting these stories. The Mahabharata makes us thirsty for more Mahabharatas because of the relentless complexity of its worldview and the ensuing magnitude of its scope, the Mahabharata persists in leaving its interpreters more to tease out, more to explore, more to complicate and to resolve. After all, as belief has it, there is something dangerous about a complete Mahabharata, and so there are many of them. One is never enough. There are Mahabharatas in Avabramsha, Assamese, Bengali, Gujarati, Hindi, Kannada, Konkani, Malayalam, Marathi, Nepali, Old Javanese, Oriya, Persian, Punjabi, Sanskrit, Sindhi, Tamil, Telugu, Urdu, and more. They testify to the fact that when it comes to this story, there will always be more to say, and there will always be more ways to say it. The many Mahabharatas that emerge from the Indian subcontinent include poems, plays, songs, sculptures, paintings, novels, folk tales, dances, short stories, comic books, essays, television shows, and films. In this, there are no categorical boundaries that the Mahabharata does not overstep. The chapters in this book show that the Mahabharata has been both elite and popular, Hindu and non-Hindu, classical and vernacular, orthodox and heterodox, constructive and destructive, textual and performative, fragmented and whole, normative and subversive, and affirming and surprising. To anyone who insists that the Mahabharata is one thing or another, we present the astounding magnitude and heterogeneity of this literary cosmos. If there is a Mahabharata, it is transhistorical, translinguistic, transmedial. It's a Mahabharata that insists on engendering more Mahabharatas, inviting more voices into the ongoing conversation. The stream is ours to step into. When we recycle the Mahabharata, whether we do so artistically or scholastically, we insist that the whole story has not yet been told. We might say that the Mahabharata occupies its own cycle of rebirth. Each telling gives the, the story a new body, a new life. Desire, always wanting these stories, keeps the cycle in motion. It is a kind of samsara. When it comes to the lives of humans and other creatures, various South Asian religious traditions speak of samsara as something to be escaped or transcended. But when it comes to stories, and particularly when it comes to the Mahabharata, we seem to find an altogether different paradigm. The Mahabharata's cycle of narrative rebirth is not one from which any of us seem to want to be free. And so when we invoke A.K. Ramanujan's famous assertion that no person belonging to South Asia ever reads the Mahabharata for the first time, let us also say in the same breath no one ever reads the Mahabharata for the last time. Our volume begins, as many Mahabharatas do, with a frame story. The academic frame story of many Mahabharatas is, of course, many Ramayanas. The visionary volume on the diversity of the, of the Ramayana narrative tradition that was edited by Paula Richman, who is the William H. Danforth Professor of South Asian Religions Emerita at Oberlin College. We were so honored that Paula agreed to write a foreword to this volume that clearly pays tribute to hers. And Paula ended up writing much more than foreword. Her piece is really a chapter in its own right. I hope we can hear more about it in the Q&A. Um, she walks us through a truly remarkable modern Mahabharata, a play called Flight from the Mahabharat, written in 1992 by the South African playwright Muthal Naidu, which uses an almost all women cast of characters from the Mahabharata to explore the relationship between genre and gender. Our introduction rounds off the framing section of the volume. Here Sohini and I wanted to develop our own theory of the case for many Mahabharatas. Why are there so many and why does that multiplicity matter? Here we talked about the inherent multivocality and multiperspectivity of the Mahabharata story and how those features beckon more Mahabharatas into being. And we also talked about what it means to read or hear or watch multiple Mahabharatas together. In this, we argued that the literature of the Mahabharata constitutes a genre unto itself, and that this can have a profound effect on how we experience it. 
Again, we took our cue from Ramanujan, who speaks of genre as a special way of listening, one that requires hearing radially, so as to take in other works, even when listening to one in particular. Here is how he describes classical Tamil poems. Every poem resonates with the absent presence of others that sound with it, like the unstruck strings of a sitar. So we respond to a system of presences and absences. Our reading then is not linear, but what has been called radial. Every poem is part of a large self-reflexive paradigm. It relates to all others in absentia, gathers ironies, illusions. One, test, one text becomes the context of others. Each is precisely foregrounded against a background of all the others. Like the poems Ramanujan describes here, Mahabharata's shape a system of presences and absences based on recurring characters, relationships, stories, themes, and aesthetics. When we experience a Mahabharata, we respond, whether we're aware of it or not, to the presence, absence, inversion, subversion, or reformation of those shared features that frame our expectations. Engaging with the Mahabharata as a genre would prompt us to listen for such resonances across languages, regions, religions, cultures, and all kinds of historical contexts. The goal of many Mahabharatas then is to facilitate this kind of listening. By representing the Mahabharata as a transmedial, transhistorical, translinguistic, and transdisciplinary mode of expression in South Asia, this book will, we hope, enable the reader to listen closely to a given interpretation of the Mahabharata while hearing a polyphony of absent tellings in the background. Now on to the first part of the volume, which we titled The Manyness of the Sanskrit Mahabharata. The chapters in this section demonstrate that even when we speak of the Sanskrit Mahabharata, we're actually invoking something that is defiantly multiplex. In his chapter, Agadapat, Murderous Rage and Collective Punishment as Thematic Elements in Vyasa's Mahabharata, Bob Goldman, who is the William and Catherine Magistretti Distinguished Professor of Sanskrit at UC Berkeley, analyzes two of the most prominent motifs in the epic's narrative framework, revenge and attempted genocide. In tracing attempted genocides as they repeat throughout the epic, Bob lays out an important starting point for the literature of the Mahabharata at large, Namely, that extreme violence is never a one-off thing, but rather one of those cycles that the Mahabharata can't let go. And we are looking forward to hearing more from Bob about his chapter soon. The next chapter, The Invention of Iravan by David Gittimer, who is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at DePaul University and who is here with us today shows how the rich narrative soil of the Sanskrit Mahabharata allows for the invention of new characters right there within the body of the text. Here, of course, the character in question is Iravan, the son of Arjuna and his serpentine lover, Ulupi. Capping off this section is Bodies That Don't Matter, Gender, Body, and Discourse in the Narrative of Sulabha by Sally Sutherland Goldman, who's senior lecturer in Sanskrit at UC Berkeley. In addition to her close reading of the story of Sulabha in the Sanskrit epic, which is remarkable in its own right, Sally does two really important things in this chapter. She engages with Nila Kanta's commentary on the Mahabharata, which is one of the epic's most important multiples. And she shows how gender criticism, far from something we modern readers bring to the Mahabharata, is in its own way right there in the epic itself. And we also look forward to hearing more from her on this chapter soon. The next section of the volume, Sanskrit Mahabharatas in Poetry and Performance, expands our definition of Sanskrit Mahabharata far beyond the early epic poem. This is a necessary task since the characters and stories of the Mahabharata virtually saturate the fabric of Sanskrit literature, which as we'll soon see, is a far reaching category in its own right. Uh, I will not say too much about my own essay, except that it is about the figure of Arjuna Brahanala as he or perhaps she appears in the Sanskrit play Pancharatra, Five Nights. But I will note that this chapter is the first of four in the volume that discuss retellings of the Virata Parvan, the part of the epic when the Pandavas and the Andropadi are living in disguise in the court of King Virata. Um, I am dying to talk about why this part of the epic is so popular to retell, but I will restrain myself. 
The next chapter is about an equally important and multivalent figure, Krishna, and an entirely different literary genre, the Mahakavya. In The Lord of Glory and the Lord of Men, Power and Partiality in Magha Shishupalavadha, Lawrence McRae, who's professor in the Departments of Asian Studies and Classics at Cornell, teaches us about the masterful ways in which the seventh century poet Magha orchestrates this emotionally intense relationship between Krishna and Yudhishthira, a relationship that contributes to Magha's aestheticized vision of rulership and adds further complications to this ever paradoxical figure of Krishna, who is the poem's hero. Next, we have a wonderful study of the Mahabharata as it is brought to life in the Kudiyatam theater tradition of Kerala. In her chapter, What are the Goals of Life? The Vidushtaka's interpretation of the Purusharatas in Kula Shekhara's Subhadra Dhananjaya, Sudha Gopalakrishnan, who is a scholar of Indian literature and performing arts and who's the executive director of Sahapedia, shows how in the Kudiyatam performance of the Sanskrit drama Subhadra Dhananjaya, the figure of the Vidushaka or the hero king's like, comic sidekick completely upends anything we think we know about the Purusharathas. In place of dharma, arata, kama, and moksha, we have entertainment, quarreling, cheating, sycophancy, and feasting. It's a testament to the tensile strength of the world of the Mahabharata in ideology as well as language, since much of the Vidushaka's performance unfolds in Malayalam. Finally, Amanda Kulp, who is adjunct professor of drama at Vassar College, showcases the staying power of Mahabharata literature in Sanskrit by analyzing three contemporary productions of Abhijnana Shakuntala. In How Do We Remember Shakuntala, the Mahabharata and Kalidasa's drama on the contemporary Indian stage, Amanda shows how three modern day productions of Shakuntala looked to the Sanskrit Mahabharata's portrayal of the Shakuntala character as an important feminist corrective to Kalidasa's vision of his heroine. Again, we see the lasting importance of the epic's way of framing the world, a capaciousness even Kalidasa failed to attain. Amanda's here with us today, and I look forward to hearing more from her in the Q&A. And that is only half of it. So over to you, Sohini. Sorry, I didn't realize I was still on mute. Thank you, Nell. So the third part of this book, Regional and Vernacular Mahabharatas from Pre-Modern South Asia, is dedicated to Mahabharatas that were composed between 800 and 1800 CE in languages other than Sanskrit. Uh, we kick off this section with Timothy Lorndale's chapter, An Old Dharma and a New Age, Duryodhana and the Reframing of Epic Ethics in Rana's Sahasa Bhima Vijaya, uh, sorry, Sahasa Bhima Vijaya, excuse me. Uh, Tim is a PhD candidate in South Asia studies at UPenn. Tim's essay investigates one of the oldest regional Mahabharata poems, Rana's 10th century Kannada, Sahasa Bhima Vijaya. This text has generally been understood as a retelling centered around the strongest Pandava hero, Bhima. But Tim contends that this poem actually retells the Mahabharata from the perspective of Duryodhana the epic supposed villain. Through close reading of Duryodhana's extended critique of the Pandavas, Tim shows that how this, in this Kannada poem, Duryodhana's revisionist interpretation of the Mahabharata opposes the normative pro-Pandava account of the epic story by actually pronouncing Duryodhana's moral code as the proper conduct for Kshatriyas or warriors. Our next chapter is Three Poets, Two Languages, One Translation, The Evolution of the Telugu Mahabharatamu by Harshita Murthinti Kamath, who is Assistant Professor of Telugu Culture, Literature, and History at Emory University. The subject of this essay is the Telugu Mahabharatamu, which was begun by Nanea in the 11th century, continued by Tikkana around the 13th century, and completed by Erana roughly another century later. Harshita traces the evolution of the dynamic relationship between Telugu and Sanskrit soundscapes, prosody, characterization, and style in the Mahabharatamu. Through a close examination of different sections of the text by each of its three different composers, Harshita reveals the immense complexities of the process of vernacularization in this Telugu poem. 
The following chapter, The Fate of Kichika in Two Jain Apapramsha Mahabharatas, is by Eva de Klerk and Simon Winont, who are both at Ghent University in Belgium. Eva is Associate Professor of Indian Language and Culture, and Simon is a PhD student. They present us with a comparison of Swayam Bhudeva's 9th or 10th century Rita Nemi Chairu and Raidu's 15th century Haribamsa Purana. While these works were composed several centuries apart in the trans-regional language of Upper Brumsha, there is evidence that the Rita Nemi Chairu and the Haribamsa Purana were read in 15th century Jain literary circles in Gwalior in present-day Madhya Pradesh in India. By comparing each of these Upper Brumsha's poems depictions of Kichika, Virata's brother-in-law who attempts to rape Draupadi during the Pandava's 13th year of exile, Ava and Simon highlight the remarkable diversity of Jain Mahabharatas. Next, we have The Power Politics of Desire and Revenge, a classical Hindi Kichikavada performance at the Tomar Court of Gwalior by Heidi Powells, who's professor in the Department of Asian Languages and Literature at UW in Seattle. Heidi complicates our study of Mahabharatas in 15th century Gwalior by bringing into focus the oldest extant Hindi retelling of the epic, Vishnu Das's Pond of Charit. Like Eva and Simon, Heidi focuses on the portrayal of Kichika and his gruesome murder at the hands of Bhima. Drawing on methods from microhistory micro as well as performance studies, Heidi's examination of the Pond of Charit interrogates the relationship between emotion and literary performance at the historical moment in which the vernacular emerged as a mode of literary expression in Gwalior. Um, and in the final chapter of this section, Blessed Beginnings, Invoking Vishnu, Krishna, and Rama in two regional Mahabharatas, I compare Viliputur's 15th century Tamil Bharatam and Sabal Singh Johan's 17th century Bhasha or Old Hindi Mahabharat. Although these texts were composed in two very different regional languages that are distinct in terms of their linguistic, geographic, and literary trajectories, these Mahabharatas share a striking feature both poems describe themselves as the charita or deeds of the Hindu deity Krishna. In my essay, I argue that one of the most effective methods that both Vili and Johan use to recast the Mahabharata as the deeds of Krishna is the insertion of elaborate invocations to various forms of the God in the beginning of the different sections of their respective compositions. The final section of many Mahabharatas examines the spectacularly diverse ways in which the Mahabharata and the idea of the Mahabharata have inspired South Asian literary, religious, artistic, and political thought from the late 19th century until the 21st. We begin with how to be political without being polemical. The, de the debate between Bonkim Chondra Chattupade and Rabindranath Tagore over the Krishna Charitra by Ahona Panda. Ahona is a humanities teaching fellow at the University of Chicago, and she analyzes two very different account, uh, accounts of Krishna's role in the Sanskrit Mahabharata that were articulated by two seminal Bengali authors and political thinkers. In 1886, when Born King was actively engaged in fostering the cause of Hindu nationalism, he wrote the Krishna Charitra, which presents Krishna as a historical figure and the embodiment of the perfect king and householder. Ahona provides us with a close reading of Tagore's quite harsh 1896 review of the Krishna Charitra and asserts that in contradistinction to Bonkim, Tagore believes that the Mahabharata is politically relevant not because it is historical, but because of its value as literature that explores the concept of flawed, her of, sorry, of flawed heroism. The next chapter, The Epic and the Novel, Buddha Dev Bose's modern reading of the Mahabharata, is by Shudipto Kobiraj, professor of Indian politics and intellectual history at Columbia. Shudipto turns to a more contemporary Bengali literary engagement with the Sanskrit Mahabharata, Buddha Dev Bose's 1974 prose study of the epic. Using Mikhail Bakhtin's 1941 essay, Epic and Novel, as a point of entrance, Shudipto shows that Bose detects certain aspects in the Mahabharata, such as its distorted aesthetic vision and its presentation of Yudhishthira as a valuable human being that actually suit the sensibility of a modern reader. Ultimately, Shudipto argues that Bose's reading of the epic articulates a modern coming of age story through the character of Yudhishthira. Then we have the chapter, Draupadi Yajnaseni Panchali Krishna, 
representations of an epic heroine in three novels by Pamela Lotspeech, who is Associate Professor of South Asian Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. Pam traces post-colonial literary representations of Draupadi in three novels by women authors, Jyotirmayi Devi's Bengali Epar Gonga, Opar Gonga, Pratibha Rai's Oriya Yajnaseni, and Chitra Banerjee Devakaruni's English The Palace of Illusions. Indebted to and invigorated by theoretical work on global feminisms, Pam's chapter demonstrates how in the last 50 years, Draupadi has become a multivalent figure in modern Indian literature. The penultimate chapter, From Excluded to Exceptional, cast in contemporary Mahabharatas, is by Sucheta Kanjilal, Assistant Professor of English and Writing at the University of Tampa. Sucheta draws our focus to modern representations of lower caste and tribal characters from the Mahabharata. She considers two Bengali short stories by Mahasweta Devi and Kiran Nagarkar's English play, Bedtime Story, as she investigates what happens to marginalized Mahabharata figures like the character of Ekalavya in modern times. Sujeta demonstrates just how complicated it is to represent social marginalities in contemporary India within the Mahabharata context. She also reveals that these works by Devi and Nagarkar, who themselves come from upper caste backgrounds, at time reflect the very oppressive structures that they're working to overturn. And finally, the book's 18th, which for those of you who might not know, is a very auspicious Mahabharata number. Um, so the 18th and final chapter, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, the Mahabharata as dystopian future, is by Philip Leckendorf, Professor Emeritus of Hindi and Modern Indian Studies at the University of Iowa. Philip examines a trilogy of graphic novels titled The Core of the Empire. Philip shows how the core of the empire adapts the international visual code of the science fiction graphic novel in order to texturize the Mahabharata's tale of fratricidal conflict. He finds that the trilogy of graphic novels draws upon another trilogy, the original Star Wars movie trilogy, so as to create a Mahabharata that will be simultaneously archaic and dystopian. In doing so, Philip brings the Mahabharata into the intimately well-known world of many readers of this book, or rather, he suggests how it has been there all along. So in a nutshell, that's the volume. And I'm going to turn it over to Bob now. Thanks. Um, Bob, I think you're Bob, muted. Bob, mic, mic. So I want to thank uh, Sohini and Nell for their remarkable presentations about this extraordinary volume that they have managed to put together uh, and their interesting summaries of some of the key points in many of the different papers that give you a general picture of uh, the richness of this volume, but of course cannot do justice to it. So I definitely suggest that you place an order as soon as possible with SUNY Press and get this book out uh, to you, your colleagues and your students. Um, and uh, before I begin my own presentation, I wanna continue on that theme. I wanna, I wanna really thank uh, Nell and Sohini for putting together this extraordinary work because it does something for the Mahabharata that has really not been done very well before. I think it was good uh, of uh, Nell to bring in the mention of uh, our dear friend Paula Richman and what she has done for Ramayana studies, along with others who have put together a number of anthologies illustrating and probing the vast diversity of Ramayana stories throughout South and Southeast Asia. But the same is true of the Mahabharata and it has rarely actually been addressed for one reason or another. Uh, most anthologies of Mahabharata uh, studies that have been done over the past several decades and conferences focus almost entirely on the Sanskrit Mahabharata. And the, as a result of that, these uh, other extremely interesting and extremely important versions of the story uh, are largely unknown to most people in the scholarly world. And these are like the Ramayana, the Mahabharata is a very, very living text uh, in good ways and bad ways uh, down to uh, the present day. 
And that's why we see people are still making movies out of it and novels out of it and poems and different versions and TV serializations. I mean, it, it's a totally endless uh, production and inspires, you know, people's daily discourse. They all know the characters and so on and so forth. And I think this is a particularly good volume to have as a, uh, an educational aid. I teach uh, every year a number of courses, but particularly a course on Mahabharata and Ramayana. And my students, who 90% of whom are from South or Southeast Asian backgrounds, all know some version of the Mahabharata. And it's not necessarily Vyasa's. And they said, no, but my grandmother told me that that isn't what happens in the Mahabharata. And so there's a hunger among the students to look at this. How is the Mahabharata framed in their own kind of culture, their own subculture, if you like. And what does it mean to them and their parents and their grandparents that you have this kind of uh, richness of, of diversity of this. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this book coming out so that we can order it for our students uh, and answer a lot of their questions uh, and so on. I, I just wanna say a word or two about um, my own paper, it was not, um, I became interested, you know, if recount of the um, reading, researching and teaching Mahabharata. It began to dawn on me what a grim text it is. I mean, everybody knows that I suppose, but that it's one kind of theme that hasn't been really tweaked out is that this is a book about a, a, not only fratricidal violence, which of course is the central to the uh, both epics really, but it's also about conflict with those characterized as other than yourself in one way or another. So this it starts, this is a, a least vast text which starts with the grisly snake sacrifice of Janamejaya which itself gets framed around the recurrent references to the extraordinary massacre, genocidal massacre of the Kshatriya class by this dark figure of the epic, uh, so-called Parashurama, who makes, if you will recall, five lakes out of the blood of his slaughtered Kshatriyas and kills them each time they somehow regenerate themselves variously. All the way through that vast text from the snake sacrifice, to the very end of the epic with the mad uh, suicidal slaughter of the Vishnis and the Andakas. Over and over again, the author or authors of this text wanted to pinpoint this, this theme of think someone offends someone in some way and the result is the extermination of their entire lineage, their entire family, their entire species unless it is stopped at some point. So there's that. And I was reading this, not so much as looking at the Mahabharata for what it can tell us about our present world in which we live, but in a sense, the other way around, what the present world we live in can tell us about the Mahabharata. And what is in the history of race riots and genocides of Native Americans in this country. And many of these things are just coming to the fore now with the kind of rising sense of this Black Lives Matter movement and so on, kind of critical turning point in uh, American history and around the world, this powerful sense of grievance against others, othering. And it seems to play into a very ugly fact about us as a species. <laughs> And this is something that was captured in a sense brilliantly and hauntingly by uh, Krishna Dwaipayana, whom you know by his alias Vyasa, that there is something inherent in the human condition that makes us want to see ourselves as different and better than the others. These things get carried out in extraordinary ways. I have a a friend of mine in, in, in India who, like many of my friends in India, is involved in a complex real estate dispute with her relatives. And she has this elaborate rendering of this whole real estate dispute as a kind of mirror of the Mahabharata. 
Pandava, right? She sees her faction of the family as the Pandavas and the other faction of the family are the Kauravas. And this is the only way she refers to them. The Kauravas are taking us to court today. So this thing is, is embedded in people's consciousness in, in that sort of way. And uh, I, I wanted to call that point out, looking at the number of times that the author brings us back to this theme. It never lets us escape it. It's not just that it's at the beginning and the end, but throughout the book, one thing after another is that same idea, the kind of exterminating up to and including, as we have seen, unfortunately, in modern history, uh, that phrase that I used, that grim and horrible phrase that I used as the title, because I'm quoting the Mahabharata, where the Haiheya clan of Kshatriyas slaughters the Brugu clan of Brahmins, Agarbat, down to the embryos in the wombs, right? And the result of that would be, of course, the birth of the sage Aurva, who then begins to slaughter the Kshatriyas, uh, and then decides, why stop at the Kshatriyas? Why don't we just destroy the world? And begins to do that until he is fortunately stopped and so on and so forth. So there's this, there's this grim kind of lesson in there. And it's not a happy story. It, it, you know, um, unlike the Ramayana, which, which ends in this almost like fairy tale environment of the Ram Rajya, where the downturn decline and uh, degeneration of human history as represented in the yuga theory is reversed by the inauguration of Rama's rule. So as the text then says, when Rama was ruling, it was Krita Yuga Yata. It was just like the Krita Yuga, this kind of um, imagined uh, utopian uh, world at the beginning of the huge cycle. But this is not the story of the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata not only narrates, but accelerates the decline of human uh, morality and conditions, right? Because we're on the very crust, crux of what uh, the late Irauti Karve called Uganda, right? The, the decline from the last heroic age of the Dwapara into the horrible conditions, which we all know from the daily papers, which is Kalikal. And uh, at the end of it, as the great uh, rhetorician uh, Abhinavagupta uh, referred to it uh, when describing the Mahabharata as a, as a literary piece dominated by what he invented essentially, he and uh, Anandavardhana as the Shantarasa, the, the, the aesthetic experience of, of tranquility that comes only from withdrawal from the world because of what he calls the uh, nirasavasana. Uh, and which leads our Vyasa Acharya, teacher only to throw up his hands in despair about the situation of the world. Urdvabahur viraomi nakashtanasranotimam. I raise my hands and cry out, but nobody listens to me. So uh, I was just a little bit inspired by these gloomy thoughts and by the current events in, in, in the world that we live in today to try to explore what it is that leads people to live in this kind of way and uh, hopes that uh, we may see some better times ahead. <laughs> so. In other words, uh, just to kind of paraphrase uh, Phillips, terrific uh, as always, essay, uh, I saw it uh, as the Mahabharata as a dystopian present, not a dystopian future. So uh, on that, I'd like to turn the virtual stage over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Sally Sutherland Goldman, who's senior lecturer in Sanskrit here at the University of California at Berkeley and take it away, Sally G. Oh, thank you. And on that cheery note, yes. <laughs> um, let's hope that uh, my end of the internet's a little more stable than uh, Bob's was, uh, and that we don't uh, cut out as much. Um, 
I'd like to begin, first of all, by thanking um, uh, Sohini and Nell for not only organizing an incredible panel back way back when in Madison, which was great fun and when I first was exposed to many of these papers, but um, for then putting together this an unbelievably wonderful volume and now for today's event as well. It's really quite impressive and I'm very, very happy to be part of it. Thank you. Uh, I also want to just express my um, thanks as always to Punita and the Institute for um, South Asian Studies for all of their wonderful work that uh, they do in general, but also for organizing today's event. Um, I was asked today to do two things. One was to look briefly at my paper and then to address the relevance of the Mahabharata uh, to a modern audience. Um, that's, of course, a topic that not it's pretty hard to do in a couple of minutes um, and so i'm just going to focus slightly on you know how i see for for particularly my work and things i'm interested in how it is it becomes a very relevant issue um uh just to give you a bit of background about my paper i was um teaching a course a few years back in Sankhya philosophy, the Sankhya Karikas, as a matter of fact, something that I, you know, like most Sanskritists, you're required to know something about, but it's, let's put it this way, it's not something I've put a tremendous amount of my intellectual energy in. And, but I was looking through the Mahabharata because of course it has a lot of underlying Sankhya material. And I came across the story um, about this woman named Sulabha, and the story is supposed to be and often is read to be and has a great deal of content on Sankhya literature, kind of Sankhya, kind of a pseudo Sankhya, if you will. Um, but when I read the episode in the Sanskrit and I read it with my class as well at one point, uh, I became engaged in the story not because of its philosophical content or even its argumentative style, which is quite interesting, but for how it represented gender and body. Uh, and these are subjects, of course, that both uh, in their intersection is something that I've always been quite interested in and have thought about a lot in my career. Um, so I came across this story. This story is about a woman named Sulabha. We're told at the beginning of the story that she's two things. We're told that she's an ascetic and that she's a woman. And we only know this because of the gender of the words used to describe her. Otherwise, there's very little to indicate what her actual gender is. Uh, we are made early on uh, aware that she has some kind of special power. Um, and uh, she hears of a one king, Janaka Videha, who has claimed that uh, he can both be a liberated man and a householder at the same time. So she then assumes this uh, Sulabha, a beautiful body of a beautiful young woman and transports herself to his kingdom, uh, wherein she introduces herself to the kingdom. And it's quite clear that if she had not been in this beautiful body, she would have never been allowed into the kingdom. Uh, and then she engages the king in a discussion. And towards the beginning of the discussion, she then literally physically enters his body. And it is there that they have this very strange discussion between the two of them and where it, it's actually a very extensive discussion and the dis, uh, it gets into a lot of philosophical uh, material. It gets into a, a number of issues on um, uh, rhetorical style and good argumentation. Uh, and of course, then at the end of the episode, she goes through an entire kind of uh, dialogue of where she literally deconstructs body, right? And then she literally tells us how body, physical body is reconstructed. And then she tells the king, basically, I'm going to spend the night in your body. Tough luck, buddy, right? And he's complaining the whole time that she's, you know, uh, you know, aggressively assaulting him and whatnot. And 
but she says, I'm going to spend the night here. And then in the morning, she wakes up apparently or whatever she does, leaves his body and leaves. And clearly the winner of this debate. So I found that this kind of whole construction and use of body in this episode just too fascinating not to address. And so that's what my paper does address. It, um, there, many people have talked about the episode, but uh, no one has really addressed it in terms of this idea of how body is read, interpreted, constructed. Um, and the episode basically, if, if you will, has uh, her construct a body, then deconstruct body, and then as it were, reconstruct body. And it's to these issues that I'm particularly interested, in, especially as we look at it in terms of kind of modern feminist readings of body. And especially if you think about Western feminist um, readings of body. And I, I'm thinking here particularly of, and I was kind of basing it on this notion um, of a lot of Western feminist scholars and led by Judith Butler, who I think very highly of, but she posits for gender, this kind of, especially for, you know, this notion of a very static body. And I just wanted to bring to light the idea in, in the, my article that we really have to be very careful when we read theories in modernity. And then we look at materials to make sure when, uh, you know, of like the epic that we, we don't presuppose something like that static state on and or assume that for the literature that we're talking about. Because here's an episode where clearly uh, it's trying to negotiate that very topic. And um, so that's, that's kind of where the title of my article comes from. And that's why I'm kind of, you know, uh, uh, negotiating around how, how we read these materials and how these materials can help us understand um, and, you know, make sure when we're reading materials, not just ancient materials, but any materials that we make sure we look at them in, you know, with a very, you know, careful critique and not just to assume because somebody is, is you know, has come up with some really interesting and important ideas that fit a certain paradigm that they're going to fit all of those paradigms. Um, so that's kind of the, the hopeful, the force of my paper and then where I was going with it. Um, the, um, what I would have to, you know, uh, particularly of interest, and I think too, to a modern audience is to be just aware of that, you know, we're not the first to think of these things or to challenge these things. Uh, and I think if nothing else, we can learn that from looking at these older and different materials, not just uh, the Sanskrit epic, but all the, you know, versions of these uh, various stories. And I think the Mahabharata and the Ramayana are very just wonderful reservoirs of information that can help us, you know, understand these types of, um, you know, that, that uh, their cultures that and ideas that have long been expressed and we just aren't aware of them and you know that we can really learn a lot from them. So I, I, that's basically all I have to say. Thank you very much again. And uh, I love everybody's article. I haven't had a chance to read them all yet, but I, the ones I have, they're just fantastic and I can't wait to finish them all. Okay, thank you, Sally and all the other uh, presenters uh, for your uh, very interesting presentations. We're now going to be uh, moving on to the uh, introduction of the participants in the project and in the volume who are present with us today. I have a list of all of them, I hope, or maybe some who may not have showed up, but I'm going to read them out and uh, invite them to uh, uh, unmute themselves and uh, start their videos as, as I call on them. Uh, we have Amanda Culp, this is in alphabetical order. Amanda Culp, who's an adjunct professor of drama at Vassar College. I'm sure you've heard introductions of many of the uh, 
uh, people in the course of the presentations. We have Eva de Klerk, uh, Associate Professor of Indian Language and Culture at Kent University. We have David Gittemar. David, are you with us today? Uh, Associate Professor of Religious Studies at DePaul University. Harshita Mrithini Kamath, Assistant Professor in Telugu Culture, Literature and History at Emory University. Hey. Kim Lorndale, PhD candidate in South Asia Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, my old alma mater. Uh, the uh, inimitable Philip Lutkendorf, Professor Emeritus of Hindi and Modern Indian Studies, uh, late of the University of Iowa, shall we say. Uh, we have Ahona Panda, uh, Humanities Teaching Fellow in South Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. Heidi Powells, uh, Professor in the Department of Asian, uh, excuse me, in the Department of Asian Languages and Literature at the University of Washington, or UW as uh, Sohini put it, in Seattle. And Paula Richman, uh, I don't know if Paula's with us today, uh, who was a contributor to the volume, uh, Professor Emerita of South Asian Languages at, at Oberlin College, and uh, Simon Winant, uh, PhD student at the Ghent University. I'm also told that Shudipto Kobiraj, Professor of Politics and Intellectual History at uh, Columbia University was uh, going to join us perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, let me remind you again, uh, if people have questions or comments they would like to make to please use the Q&A button and then I will read out the question and uh, those on the panel uh, would be uh, called upon to respond. So let's move ahead. Let me check the questions tab and see what's going on. Let's see. I have no open questions yet. Has anybody? Can I just first say how it's amazing everyone is here. I'm so happy to see everybody. Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, can I uh, make a comment before we get any questions? Sure. Hopefully we will. Um, which is just to thank um, Sohini and Nell again, and, and uh, particularly uh, expanding on what Sally said not just for organizing the symposium and coming up with the idea of the volume, but also for their extraordinary editorship and the way that they shepherded us through the production process. We all know how difficult edited volumes can be. Mm -hmm. And um, it really is important to have very responsible people doing the editing and Sohini and Nell were absolutely model and uh, also excellent copy editors, um, which is especially helpful um, nowadays when copy editors are hard to come by. So I think we all, all of us who uh, contributed benefited from that. And I wanna thank them, acknowledge them publicly. Thank you for the comments, uh, Philip. I have a couple of questions coming in that I'm going to read out. I have a question from Roberto Morales. It says, thank you for your presentations. I have two questions for Nell, one, from your knowledge of the play and its epic sources, what could be the inspiration of the number five as the set number of nights in Bhasa's Pancharatra? That's question one. Two, going back to your observation about the book having various chapters related to the Virata Parvan, which books of the Mahabharata inspire <clears throat> the more retellings and which of them inspire the less and why? Oh, that's interesting. So now you've been called on for that. All right, thank you so much. Um, great. Um, I'll just say just the a quick word about um, the number five in in the the name of the play that I'm writing about in my chapter is called Pancharatra Five Nights, um, and that is as far as I can tell based on something that happens in the plot of that play where there is um, essentially um, the, an agreement about, an agreement or rather a wager is made about um, whether something will be able to happen over the course of five nights. So my understanding is that the number five comes from that uh, plot device. Um, 
So I'll now move on to what I think is a, a really interesting and important question about why um, certain episodes are retold sort of more often than others. And I think this is a great question. I'd really love to hear what other folks on our panel have to say about this. So I'll try to keep my remarks brief and say only that when it comes to the Virata Parvan in particular, I think, I think there are two things that are happening here. One, which may in fact be one thing, one is that in the Virata Parvan, um, you have, as many people have observed, a sort of entire Mahabharata in miniature. Um, the, right, all the disguises are intensely self-reflexive. Everything that happens is a reflection of something that already has happened or will happen in the epic. Um, so the, the Virata Parvan is, the Mahabharata sort of in disguise as itself. And not only that, but it's in disguise as itself in a sort of inverted way. In the Virata Parvan, things end up okay in a way that they don't in the actual longer Mahabharata, right? So the Virata Parvan, because, because that's where Kichika and all of his brothers get slain and you know, Bhima is actually able to step in and, and, uh, and fight for Draupadi and, and all of that, um, things go okay in the Virata Parvan in a way that they really don't in the rest of the epic as Bob has told us about. And so the Virata Parvan has, um, because of those two things, the fact of it's all being a multiple of the Mahabharata within the Mahabharata, I think that is one of the reasons it is super fruitful for um, for other retellings, and also because it's a it's a place where, unlike in the rest of the epic, things sort of there is a sense of resolution that you don't often get elsewhere. But I'd love to hear what other folks have to say about this, especially the um, other um, authors who wrote about the Virata Parvan. So let me go back to being on mute. And I know there are more questions in the pipeline also. Yeah, we'll get to them in a minute. <clears throat> Just one observation about five, which struck me, is why are there five Pandava brothers? It's very convenient for the purposes of Digvijaya. You see, here's Yudhishthira as the high king. He just happens to have four brothers. So you can send them in the four directions. It's all very convenient. So there's that. And of course, the Virata is, is, a, is a wonderful book. And it's also a kind of almost comical uh, inversion of the uh, theme of the center, especially of the Gita with the switch around of uh, Uttara and uh, Brahmanada as charioteer and warrior. And that's a kind of almost a parody of the opening of the Gita where here it's where Uttara can't fight because he's scared shitless essentially, <laughs> rather than his moral, uh, kind of, pardon my French. Um, any other comments on that before we move on? Yeah, I was yeah. going to mention, um, also, isn't there some tradition of the Virata being, I mean, we, we had discussed this, I think, Bob, uh, in terms of the Sundarakanda, that the Virata may be the place where the recitation or the Parayana of the Mahabharata starts? That's true. Right, and so that could be one of the reasons. It kind of, in some ways, can be seen to parallel the kind of functionality of the Sundarakanda in the Ramayana. Mm -hmm. Mm. And um, if I can add, you know, the Virata climaxes in this colossal battle in which nobody important gets killed and, um, <laughs> and in which the Pandavas win easily, which is what they're supposed to do. That's what everybody keeps saying they're going to do in the main battle. But in fact, we, when we get to the main battle, we discover that it isn't easy at all. And they have to cheat, you know. Not so, the Pandavas, it's but Arjuna it, alone yeah. wipes out the entire army. Right, exactly. It puts them all to sleep. It steals their clothes. <laughs> but um, but uh, it always reminds me of you know the play within a play in Shakespeare and certain certain of the big Shakespeare plays and uh, that sort of magic of creating that within. Uh, so that's just another observation on on its appeal. Okay, let's move so on. I just want to quickly say, um, I think Bob uh, for, just forgot to introduce Sucheta Kanjilal, who is also with us today. Oh, There's so many of us, I, yes. you know, um, but so Such Sucheta if, if, uh, Kanjilal, yes. assistant professor of English and writing at the University of Tampa. So my apologies, Sucheta. Mm -hmm. uh, our next Thank question you. is from Srinivas Chari. 
The question is, does the invocation to Nara and Narayana in the opening lines of the epic, and I might add every book of the epic, refer to Arjun and Krishna in the Gita? I could say something on that. Uh, yes, it does, actually. Uh, everybody knows that in a sense, but the, the one place where it's made very explicit in the Mahabharata is in that famous story of the five Indras, if you remember that. In the story of the five Indras, when um, uh, Indra is humiliated by Shiva and uh, then captured with the other five Indras, and then eventually the resolution of the story is that uh, he will be born as Arjuna and uh, and as the uh, primordial sage Nara would be Arjuna, while Krish, uh, Krishna himself, uh, Vishnu himself will be born as Krishna Vasudeva. So that's made quite explicit in that uh, section. In the, all the many versions of the Mahabharata, are women's roles more elevated in some and not so in others? Good question. This in light of the Hindu surge during Modi's time in today's India, which has pained many of us, in, many of us Indian women. Somebody wanna take that about the women characters in Mahabharata, very important question. I mean, I think Amanda is in a place to yeah, I was going to say, I don't know about everyone else, but I didn't hear the whole question. I just heard the last half of it. The questions are in the many versions of Mahabharata, talking across the board of, of all these versions we've been discussing, are women's roles more elevated in some and not so in others, in, in the different versions. This is a, in light of the Hindutva surge during the era of uh, Modi, in, which has pained many Indian women. So yeah, I can I can speak just to the the episode that I'm writing about, which is um, from the Adi Parva, the book of the beginning, looking at uh, the narrative of Shakuntala, who is this kind of mythical mother figure to the Bharatas um, through her son, and uh, the dramatic interpretations that I'm looking at uh, are are of interest to me because they kind of look back to. Shakuntala from the epic as a much more empowered female figure in her uh, interactions with Dushenta, the king who uh, ends up impregnating her and, and being the father of this heir character. And when Kalidasa adapts this play, this story into his play, uh, Shakuntala loses a lot of that fire. Uh, Romila Tapar has a great analysis of, of the differences between those two characters in a literary capacity. And so we do definitely see, at least like with that character, um, the way that she was adapted by Kalidasa in the fourth to fifth century, um, she is quite diminutive. She is quite, um, uh, she's, she's not nearly as fiery as she is in the Mahabharata. And then the dramatic adaptations that I'm looking at are from the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s, um, where we see directors try to give the character within Kalidasa's play, try to give her back some of that fire and reclaim uh, some of the agency that she has in negotiating the way that story plays out for her in the epic as opposed to the dramatic text. Okay, I have a question from Hamsa Stanton. Hi, Hamsa. Uh, he says, thank you for this wonderful panel. I'm losing the question here. And all, and uh, since you've seen the movie now, okay. Given the long history of reflection on the Ramayana and the Mahabharata trans narratives in relation to one another, I'm thinking, for example, of Yigal Browner's work on Shlesha that tells both stories, these texts, I assume you're referring to the uh, Raghava Pandavia and that sort of thing. I was wondering if the editors or contributors could speak to what this new book suggests about the relationship between the many Ramayanas and the many Mahabharatas. What is parallel or different in the manyness of these traditions? Very good question. Again, uh, not to put you on the spot, Paula, but I think you kind mm -hmm. of beautifully um, talk about this in your forward, especially with stories with characters from both the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, mm -hmm. if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Just briefly, um, in a number of, of parts of India, there's a category that performers use, they call it Puranic, but it basically, it applies to plays that they do from any of the epics and the Puranas, and they don't see the epics as a totally different thing. 
for them, you know, if you're going to do a performance, you pick from whichever text seems appropriate. And I found that kind of interesting because in academics, they're always seen as such different, you know, epic narratives. I would have to say that one of the things that uh, seems to, that leapt out at me immediately was that the Mahabharata was so much darker in many ways than the Ramayana, but it also meant that um, the characters in the Ramayana had to live up to much higher standards um, because they're considered ideal and anything that they did wrong was often the basis for so much criticism and an attempt to say by some people that Rama really wasn't the perfect human being. So those are just some thoughts off the top of my head. You know, going back to that other question that occurs to me, at least in the Ramayana, you talk about the, the various representations of the female characters. One, one thing you could look at, and I don't know if this exists for Mahabharata, frankly, I haven't looked into this, is this proliferation of these so-called Shakta versions of uh, the Ramayana. If you look at something like the Adbhuta Ramayana, in which Sita is divinized and actually gives a, uh, a, an imitation of Krishna's self-revelation in the Gita, Right, you have this uh, this Swarupa Darshana of Sita and these ones in which she's more powerful than Rama and so on. I don't know if you see this in any of the... ...from Saurav Ghosh here. He says, hi, Ahona. Could you please tell us a little bit about the reception of Tagore's critique of Bankim Chandra's interpretation of Krishna? Thank you. Um, thanks, Sora. Uh, so I just wanted to say that, no, I haven't really read very much on Tagore's review essay, but to talk a little bit about the milieu in which it was written. So it was first published in the Sadhana magazine, in, uh, which was a periodical um, in two parts. Um, and then it was later uh, republished in an anthology of Tagore's in 1907 uh, called um, Adhunik Shaito, so Modern Literature. And one thing that I kind of, now that I have the opportunity, I'd like to talk about this. Um, so both, uh, so Tagore's review is happening within a specific kind of uh, milieu of philology and uh, literary criticism. And that's something that I talk about in my essay um, that he talks about Bunkin's um, use of criticism in Shomala Chana. And it marks the beginning of a new phil philological method. And, and um, Mahabharata and Krishna is, I think, kind of an occasion for uh, Bunkim and Tagore, uh, Tagore to kind of critique Bunkim. And the two are having uh, a conversation in which, um, you know, the questions of what is evidence, uh, what is historical evidence, uh, what act, you know, what is reading, what is really reading critically and what kinds of interpretive acts uh, does reading comprise? So these are some of the things that I think I'm interested about in my essay. Actually, uh, I was uh, inspired by Ahona's uh, presentation at the uh, conference and in the paper to uh, spin off a little bit of that in a paper I did for a, uh, a, a seminar in commemoration of uh, Romila Tapa uh, about what are the basis for understandings of the historicity of texts like this because you have this idea of Bonkim that the Mahabharata is a, an kabbomoyetihasha, uh, uh, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a history that is in a poetic form, whereas uh, Rabindranath is coming back and says it's more like an aitihashika kabbo, right? A historical poem, you know, more or less like a historical novel, which then wouldn't have to adhere closely to the boundaries of uh, historical reality, but it brings up the question of what constitutes his historical credibility in various cultures. The point here is that for the, in, for the intended receptive audience of these texts, these are poems written by infallible rishis who are inspired. So that's in place of the kind of research that a modern historian does. They already know everything. That's, that's the, the conceit that you have there. So, so that has to be, I think, looked at as in, in the idea of the reception of these texts. Is it historical? 
Western scholars have said, well, these can't be restar historical because they're full of all kinds of nonsense and we don't have uh, historic graphical material on those eras. But then you have to understand what constitutes the historicity of the history uh, in, in the receptive audiences of uh, texts like Mahabharata and uh, Ramayana. If I could just add one more thing, Professor Gordon. Um, so I think that there's also a moment in which a translational project is happening in many ways. And history and literature, I think, don't easily map onto Itihasa and Kavya. Mm. And this is something that I found really striking, especially in Tagore's discussion of Anumana and, and uh, Tatya and facticity and why um, even if there is kind of some claims of historicity that the Mahabharata continuously make, um, the grounds of thinking about that should not be the way in which um, a Western audience would understand um, Anumana and uh, Tatya. Mm, correct. I have a question <clears throat> from an anonymous attendee. Do you find that the retellings of the Mahabharata are reflective of the times in which they came about? Are you able to glean something about the social values and societal structures of the time based on the particular retelling? Well, of course, uh, these texts tend to reflect the culture uh, in which they are composed and received. And they're also intended to influence the culture in which they're received. So, you know, the, the, both epics put a great premium on Varnashrama Dharma, which is a prescriptive notion of, of social relations, which may or may not be the actual experience of people in the real world. But these are Shastras as well as Itihasas. So uh, you have to take that into consideration. The, uh, Philip, you have a hand up? Well, yeah, I can easily uh, respond in terms of the uh, graphic novels that I wrote about. Here's the cover of one of them. Um, <laughs> being, you know, very recent indeed, uh, 2016, 2017, um, they very much are uh, responding to um, certain current phenomena and to, to particularly the sort of dystopian um, mode in uh, sci-fi and in graphic novels, international graphic novels in general. Um, and reading the Mahabharata against that, which is, you know, in some ways not so hard to do. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, a very, very specific kind of uh, invocation of the present situation from a certain perspective. One of the things I, I do in my essay is to talk about the presence and absence of science fiction as a genre in India, in South Asia, um, which is a topic that's interested me for a long time, and particularly in relation to cinema. Uh, and then I use it to, to go into these, these very sci-fi uh, graphic novels. You know, one thing that one might read up since I was talking about these ideas of othering and genocide. If you look at the two epics com comparatively, uh, their notions uh, of uh, social relations between the central heroic uh, princely elites and others are rather different. There's of course the whole brutalization of Karna because of his supposedly low caste uh, uh, you know, existence in, in the uh, Mahabharata. But you look at the treatment in the two epics of the Nishadas, for example. Now you have, of course, the famous example of Ekalavya, who's not accepted into the, the martial arts dojo of Dronacharya because he's a Nishada, all right. That's excuse. And then he has to sacrifice his thumb. What often gets overlooked is that the Pandavas thoughtlessly murder an entire family of Nishadas, burn them alive, after getting them drunk at a party uh, to escape through a tunnel uh, from the so-called lacquer house. That's, that's not commented on in the, uh, in the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata commentaries ignore it, except for Nila Kanta's kind of throw a remark that they were Kala Chodita. <laughs> it, was, it was their time to die, essentially, right? And I mean, you look in the, Maha, the Ramayana, on the other hand, there are very cordial relations between the royal court of Ayodhya and the, the Nishada forest people of uh, Guha, right? So that so suggests the different attitudes and the different times perhaps at which these 
these uh, epics were composed? Uh, I don't know, but it, there's certainly a stark difference in that. When these uh, Pandavas can brutally murder this innocent uh, Nishada woman and her five sons, uh, and then when they're trekking into the Himalayas at the end and each one is falling on the road because of some minor peccadillo <laughs> that they committed. Oh, Arjuna didn't, he said he was gonna kill all of the Kauravas in one day and he didn't, so oop, he goes. So, you know, that's something completely ignored. I think Heidi and, and Sucheta have their hands up also. Okay, I do. This topic. Okay. Uh, yes, Heidi has a hand up, go ahead. Heidi. All right, is it okay if I go first, Sucheta-ji? Um, I just wanted to, to say that uh, the papers by Eva the Cleric, uh, Simon and myself, grew out of exactly that concern. And it's easier, of course, for when you have um, Mahabharata versions that are dated and set in a particular time and place. Uh, and for our case, it was 15th century Gwalior, where you had the newly established Tomar dynasty in a context of um, instability within uh, the Sultanate at the time. And um, that's why we have these uh, corresponding papers because we actually had a project going, uh, the outcome of which was published just recently in the Journal of uh, South Asian History and Culture, uh, where we uh, think about what was going on in Tomar Gwalior at the time. And a very interesting uh, contrast there was that we had um, at the same time this like first vernacular Hindi uh, Mahabharata version by Vishnu Das in 1435 and around the same time and Eva and Simon can say something more about that a Jaina version which is often kind of neglected in thinking about the Mahabharata uh, and we were trying to grapple with why at the Tomar court so maybe I should uh, let Eva and Simon talk about their side of things but uh, Sucheta had also had a question okay. I can say more but Go ahead. No, thank you oh, sorry Okay, um, what I really wanted to say is, uh, I thought that was a very interesting question uh, where we think about how uh, the adaptations and the times that they are rewritten in um, tell us more about the times. I found uh, that in the text that I write about in my chapter, uh, which is Kiran Nagarkar's Bedtime Story, he actually wrote uh, that chapter in response to the emergency. And it actually um, was never published at that time. They uh, tried to stop the play from happening because it had a very direct and critical relationship to the role of the Indian army and the government. But by the time it gets published, uh, it's 2015. And at this time, I believe there, uh, there's been a great deal of interest in publishing more Mahabharata retellings, because as we uh, said, as, as it was mentioned, um, there's a new crop of Indian English readers who are hungry to rehearse the Mahabharata again and again. And I think even the publication history and the rise of Hindu nationalism and neoliberalism and the surprising places they intersect um, affects how uh, these retellings appear and even reappear or you know they are re-unearthed or allowed to be published. So I, I thought that was remarkable. Do we have another response on this uh, topic? Yeah, let's, let's, go to, let's go to Eva to just follow up on Heidi's point and thanks Sucheta. Eva? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, it's uh, just uh, indeed give the kind of the background for the for the Jane papers. It was very interesting to see while on the one hand you have Vishnu Vishnu Das who who you know um, whose um, epic retellings in in Hindi got quite got some you know some 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 interest, especially in in the framed within this kind of you know in Sheldon Pollock's theory of uh, you know the um, um, uh, epic retellings in the vernacular and this kind of you know the, the the regionalization vernacularization while at the same time in fact indeed you have it in the same place you have a, a different well could, can you call it a different community I don't know these Jains these Jane merchants from within these Jane merchant communities you have um, different kinds of uh, versions of, of the epics also being composed there. And, and really, uh, not just one Mahabharata, you have uh, actually, I mean, there's evidence of at least um, engagement with at least four different versions of, uh, of the Mahabharata composed by Jain authors that were circulating in that, 
in that same community. And of course, I mean, the, the authors don't really give any hint or give any clue, or at least they're not explicit about their motivation. And, and that set us, us thinking about, you know, what could be possible reasons behind, you know, this multiplicity indeed. And, and uh, yeah, it's all very fascinating. And uh, of course, yeah, <laughs> our guess is, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting people bringing up these Jain versions of the story. I have actually published on the uh, Jain Pandava Purana, uh, which, yeah. you know, are kind of Jain uh, polemical texts, but they're also sharp critiques of the Sanskrit Mahabharata. Mm. Is that uh, somebody comes to a, a sage and he says, I've heard this story of the Mahabharata. Can you tell me, can all of these things be true? And they make extraordinary claims about the Mahabharata. They say that actually Gandhari was actually sleeping with a hundred goats, the ghosts yeah. of a hundred goats, so that's how she got her hundred sons. And then the, the Acharya, the Muni says, no, no, that's all this rubbish of the Shaivas. That's ah, how that's the, it's the Shaivas. That's Valichandra's yeah, Vali Vali Purana. Vali Chandra's Purana, exactly. I do have an but it's not necessarily universal to all uh, Jain Mahabharatas. No. For example, Devar Basui's Bhagavad Gita doesn't really deal in reputation, as far as I've noticed. It doesn't really. It doesn't start with a frame story of, um, 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 you know, um, this king uh, Shemika approaching Mahavira and asking about the true Mahabharata. That doesn't appear in in some Shradamara version. So it's not universal. Like yeah. it's more of the the, the later. Like the, the Gamma yeah, versions of a uh, past uh, the 16th century. But it's not universal. Not all of them are very explicit in their reputation. Right, but there are these other versions of these stories of the Krishna Charita that come from different uh, religious traditions. You know, one thing that I know uh, Heidi has written about is, is like uh, uh, Jayasi's uh, Kanhavat, you see, which is a kind of, as she says, a kind of parodic. In a way, version of the uh, of the Krishna Charita from an Islamic Sufi standpoint. So, so these these things are open to other audiences to play with as they like. Today, of course, you take your life in your hands if you play with these too much. And that's happened in the Ramayana studies too. You know, over the fights over the Dasharatha Jataka and all kinds of extraordinary things that have happened. Or Ramanujan's article at Delhi University, if you remember that uh, saga, how they, uh, the Hindu Torah crowd attacked the history department at uh, Delhi University because they, uh, Upinder, Shah, uh, Upinder Singh had included uh, Raman's uh, 300 Ramayanas in the course syllabus. And that was considered an offense against Hinduism and so on. So, you know, you have a different kind of atmosphere. Let me move on again. Uh, we have an anonymous uh, question. I've been told by the organizers at the Institute that we can push on for an extra 10 minutes because there's so many interesting things to say and so many interesting questions. Uh, here's the anonymous uh, questioners, uh, question. Now that we've begun to understand the Mahabharata along with the Ramayana as inherently multiple, can we begin to make a more general theory of how textual narrative relates to multiplicity in the South Asian context? Mm. Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, you know, there's, there's a cultural fascination with story. You know, a lot of these stories originate in India. You know, this, this is the, the ocean of stories model, you know, that uh, you just keep telling these stories, which mutate and morph according to the teller and the culture and the time and so on and so forth. So it's a, a natural thing because it's a, as Ramanujan said, you know, texts like that are, are not just a story, but a language in which people communicate, right? So, so Ramayana or Mahabharata can turn up in any context from, you know, uh, advertisements. You remember the uh, Domino's pizza ads on television where they're doing in the middle of a uh, Ram Lila, uh, when Ravan is carrying off Sita, his pizza arrives and then he drops Sita and goes to the Domino's pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, Himi, you have a question? Yeah, Can't... I'm just, again, I'm sorry to put people on the uh, the spot, but um, Professor Kobiraj, I, I just remember from, you know, um, 
being a master's student with you at Columbia and, and writing a paper on the Ramayana and the Mahabharatas and, and you explaining to me that in, in Bangla, both are considered Mahakavyas and within a single genre. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on this. Unmute yourself, Shudipta Da. Thank you. I, I don't think I have much to offer on that, except that uh, I generally agree with what uh, um, Robert was saying that, uh, you know, it, it's a culture in which uh, stories are generated in two different ways. One is, uh, but you can also generalize even more and say that, you know, anything which is built in words, it also elicits <laughs> responses in words. But more than that, what I find interesting is that if you look at the Krishna story, which I've looked at a bit more closely because of my interest in Bonkim, Bonkim and Tagore, et cetera. Um, what is interesting is that you know, in the Mahabharat, you have the Krishna story in which you do not have very much on Krishna's early life, but uh, it creates a kind of infra narrative space where later on people would come and uh, and construct a whole story which you put there. And I think this actually goes on continually. I have a question from Sravani K. She says, thanks for this exciting volume and event. Given your work on this volume, would you be able to perhaps enlist some key contingencies that may have influenced and shaped the production of the many Mahabharatas? I'm thinking of factors such as language, region, localized conventions, etc. But I'm curious about the findings that emerge out of this volume as a whole. So maybe Nell or Sohini can take that. <clears throat> to get put on the spot themselves. I very much want to turn this over to Sohini. <laughs> Could, could we interrupt this moment for an important announcement from yeah. our colleague, yes, David perfect, Gittimer, perfect opportunity. <laughs> which I think is uh, something that many, many people, before we lose many more participants, we should hear. Um, <clears throat> so just very brief background. Um, you know, in the, uh, in the person of one particular, um, and I will call him evil editor at the University of Chicago Press, um, there was a decision made that all the other volumes, um, which many of us have been working on for quite a long time, I actually finished a complete draft of Bhishma last year. Um, the press decided to cancel the series, only permitting the second volume of Jim Fitzgerald's um, Shanti, Shanti uh, to be published. Oh, wow. um, and through the active efforts of um, Fred Smith of Iowa um, in consultation with um, our esteemed co colleague, Patrick Olivelle, we have, um, we've made contact with uh, a publisher who's actually been named in this conversation, but I can't say anything yet in India, um, who is right now uh, sending us contracts um, to do all the other volumes for Fred's four last volumes, my Bhishma, Chris Minkowski's involved. Uh, I don't know if any of these people are in the audience. Um, there'll be a more formal announcement coming soon. And um, this is also a shout, shout out to Bob and Sally because there's going to be a format change. And some of that format change has been inspired by the, um, the, the familiar uh, Ramayana translation format that we know. Um, but all of these things are coming out, but it's happening. So um, just wanted to let you know, yeah. <laughs> Such wonderful news, thank you. Um, and just yeah, for that- Congratulations, that's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, and just for that earlier question, I think it's a very complex question and one that Nell and I, you know, take 34 pages to try and address um, in our introduction. And so just to give other authors a chance to speak, I'll, I'll just leave it um, there that I would hope you could read our introduction where we, we really try and deal with that question, but thank you. Um, are there other questions, Bob, that we still have?
He may have frozen there temporarily. Okay. Um, I can read the next question. Um, we have one from Alekia Malady, and I, I don't see Bob on my screen. Um, I think he froze and went out. I'll see. Okay. Um, and she says, thank you for organizing such an informative panel. Looking forward to reading the book. Um, what is the origin of the beautiful art on the cover of the book? And so I'm just going to take this as an opportunity to share my screen with you all and, and show you the cover of the book. Um, can you all see the cover? Yes, okay, so this is a beautiful painting um, by Balaji Srinivasan, um, who is in Chennai, I believe, and um, it was painted in 2015, it's, it's called Draupadi. Um, and the reason why Nell and I picked it is because um, there are many Draupadis, many images of Draupadi on this cover. Um, it's painted in the style of the um, Chitrakati painting um, picture storytelling tradition that was once practiced in Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Andhra Pradesh. Um, and these four, five different types of Draupadi, I'll just go through them quickly. Um, we first see Draupadi at her Swayamvara, where she is, um, you know, getting ready to um, her so-called, um, and, and Heidi has great work on the the, um, the term Swayamvara and a bridegroom choice ceremony. Is it actually that or not? Um, I'll just leave that there for now. Um, so that's the first image. Then, then we have Draupadi during her famous disrobing with you know, these never ending garments. And then we have three images actually from the Terukutu tradition in um, Tamil Nadu, which is this kind of street theater um, tradition that is associated with the Draupadi, among the, Dra the goddess Draupadi cult in Tamil Nadu. And so first um, in the middle, we have Draupadi as a, a, a Kuranvanji, this fortune teller who's preparing to tell the Korova woman their fortune and Sahadeva, one of the Pandava brothers is disguised as a baby on her hip, which is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Then we have um, Draupadi, um, as the goddess Kali, actually, who comes and sucks blood from the battleground of Kurukshetra at night. And then on the far right, we have Draupadi Amman, who is, you know, this beautiful local deity in Tamil Nadu, um, who's worshipped with um, a parrot sitting on her hand. Um, and so that's very briefly the, um, the story of the cover image. I think, I think this would, thank you so much, Sohini. Um, I think this would also be a good opportunity, even though I know it comes a little bit as an at an angle, to turn the stage over to Harshita, if that's okay, because I know that Draupadi makes quite an appearance in your chapter. Um, and here is, I think, I think your chapter is a wonderful example of a way in which, though of course it's not, you know, in the in the visual language of art, but in the in the in the musical language of poetry, that the, the sort of Draupadi that, that you write about in the Telugu Mahabharatamu in its three versions um, really does sort of complement and contrast with the version of Draupadi that we see in the Sanskrit epic in some interesting ways. So maybe for a sixth Draupadi, we could turn over to you, Harshita. Um, thank you. And thank you, Nell and Sohani, for your fearless leadership on this volume. Um, I'll just say as background um, of the Telugu Mahabharatamu that it um, I was interested in it like any student of classical Telugu because it's actually the very first classical Telugu text that's composed. Um, and I use the word composed rather than translated because Nanne is composition. Nanne is 11th century poet um, who composes the text writing in a regional Vingi Chalukya um, kingdom and he dedicates it to his king. So it's the kind of classic example that, that Shelley Pollock talks about in terms of vernacularization. And um, that, that Nanea's Mahabharata really becomes the Mahabharata in the Telugu landscape. So um, one of the arguments is that the Sanskrit really becomes superfluous. But I've recently been rereading our reading sections of the Nala and Damayanti story um, this past year um, with Alekia, who actually asked the question um, about the co cover art. and. Um, one of the things that's been interesting for us as we've been rereading is to see the kind of um, hidden, um, maybe almost like we can see the, the Sanskrit structure behind the text in some ways. And that's one of the claims that I make in the, the chapter is thinking about what happens when we, when a language moves into the literary vernacular sphere of vernacular literary languages um, and how how does a text or an epic like the Mahabharata transform? And so actually what I argue is that it's not Nanneya, who's the first Telugu poet, but it's actually Dikana of the 13th century who just does something totally different. And we start to get really deeply Telugu resonances, even in things like meter. And so I actually explore two different um, uh, poems written by these two different poets, both in the Shardula meter, Shardula Vikritita meter, 
Um, and at the mini Mahabharata pre-conference, actually sing the two different verses and they're quite distinct in their recitation styles too. And that verse was actually set, um, the, the one in, by Thikana was set in Draupadi's voice, um, castigating Kichika. So it's interesting also to think about how the ways in which Virata Parvan um, ends up being uh, animating our conversations um, in the volume, also how Kichika shows up in several places, um, and also the ways in which performance, um, uh, both within the context of the narrative as well as more broadly within plays and other contexts as well. Bob, you're on mute, I think. Yeah, I want to move along a little. Just one uh, footnote to David's comment about publication and stuff like that. I couldn't resist. Uh, this is just to let you know that Princeton's going to be coming out with a single unabridged uh, translation uh, of the Ramayana this fall for use in schools and other areas for people who don't want to invest their life savings in the Princeton <laughs> seven volume set. Um, <clears throat> I have a question from Vasudha Narayanan. Thanks for a great panel. Questions for Sohini and Paula. Why is it that despite their considerable literary merits, neither Villi's Bharatam nor Kamban's Ramayana, unlike the Manas, figure highly in the Bhakti world of the Tamil people? Um, I can quickly take a stab at this, Paula. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Vasumami, for that wonderful question. Um, let me just say that actually this is um, an argument I'm making in my dissertation uh, that Kamban actually isn't um, necessarily a bhakti narrative poem in the way we think of um, Tulsi Das's Ram Charit Manas. Um, and this is actually building off of the work of Anne Monius, who we um, you know pay tribute to in our volume and who I talked about in the beginning, um, in which she kind of points out um, that uh, the name Shiva comes up more than the name Rama in the Irava Avataram, and she kind of posits the um, Irama Avataram as a poem in which um, Kamban is actually paying tribute to Shiva and kind of um, going through this I, these ideas of incarnation, but through a Shaivite kind of lens. Um, and so I'm building off of that in my dissertation, but I am making an argument that um, Vili, you know, really is a Sri Vaishnava Bhakti poem. Um, and uh, again, I would be happy if any of you are interested, I, I'd be happy to share more about my dissertation research with you, but um, just in a nutshell, uh, I think it is, but it, it just, it hasn't been received in that same way. Though I will say Billy is called Billy Putter Alvar, you know, he does have that title. Kamban occasionally is also called Kamban Alvar, not as commonly as Billy is, but um, they have certainly been received in that way also. Uh, next question, Bob. <clears throat> Very interesting question from Sirangini Kumari. Greetings and thanks for highlighting many aspects of text. I am much in retrieving transgender voices, not only as a person, but also as a process that could be retrieved from the text. Because when we see from gender lens, there is a tendency to promote certain dominant voices. And here, the more emphasis is made on the, unide the uh, idealizing certain forms of masculinity and femininity coded with dharma at the cost of marginalizing non-normative ones. So how can we trace such process and deconstruct beyond just mere representations like that of Shikandi and Arjuna as Brihannala in Mahabharata? Anybody have anything interesting on that? Well, I guess I have, that's exactly what my paper was doing, uh, mm -hmm. or does do. It, it looks at an episode where you do challenge those very constructions and undermines, you know, this kind of notion that uh, a body, a gendered body is a fixed construction, at least in that narrative. And that's not to say that it's not a masculinist point of view from the ep obviously the episode is going to be uh, coming out of uh, that kind of masculinist point of view to begin with I and mean, that one assumes the composer is masculine we don't have proof of that but one assumes that given the rest of the epic but I mean the, the episode clearly speaks to someone who is you know trying to negotiate those very very issues of what is gender what is body how do we define that? And especially using in this uh, Sankhya tradition to uh, help rationalize it in a larger philosophical uh, construction. Uh, and it's clearly, uh, you know, uh, something that is a little stressful for the commentator, Nilakantha, 
I mean, he addresses it quite the whole episode in, in fairly, uh, a fairly detailed way. And so you can see that the composer of the episode was, you know, trying to negotiate this issue of gender. And Nilekanta is unhappy with that negotiation and is trying to reframe it in various ways. So, I mean, I think you have to look to stories like that. There are only very few hints in, in the epic, especially the, you know, the Sanskrit Mahabharata of those things. I think you might look at other versions of it, I'm sure. I mean, I don't have the full awareness of all the, the various versions of these texts, but I would be very unsurprised if there weren't more versions of stories in various uh, uh, regional versions that didn't challenge gender in similar ways. We, uh, we're kind of getting short on time here. I have a few more questions, actually a lot more questions. And I don't Sorry, think- Bob, can I just offer really quickly, there's a fabulous, this is from a, a very kind of contemporary adaptation, but um, some really exciting work being done in the theater world, uh, revisiting the trans narratives in the story. And I would I would I encourage the asker of this question to look up Gita Reddy's adaptation of the Mahabharata that was produced yeah. at the mm -hmm. uh, Ubuntu theater in, uh, in Berkeley or uh, yeah. Oakland. Yeah. Um, but it was really, really a fabulous production performed by a non-binary actor that, uh, that by putting the stories into this actor's body really uh, begins to, uh, to queer all of the narratives, not just those ones that pop up, Bridhanala and, uh, and Shikandi, so. Thanks for that, Amanda. I have a couple of more questions and we may not get to all of them now. But I have a question here from uh, Raj Balkaran. Thanks for putting together this rich publication. Has anyone come across the idea that the five Pandavas plus Draupadi makes for an intriguing Sankhya metaphor for the individual soul, Draupadi enmeshed in the Pancha Mahabhutas, five elements. Do any of the contributions look at the interplay between frame narratives and reader response theory? P.S. Quite looking forward to having Sohini and Nell on the New Books in Indian Religions podcast soon to discuss many Mahabharatas. So. Anyone on that, on the Sankhya angle? It's complex stuff. Tim, um, do you have any thoughts? We just haven't been able to hear from you at all today. So I just love to give yeah, you a chance. I, yeah, I also, I actually thought that the, the previous question about the concept of unidealizing dharma, even though Tim's piece does not sort of look at that from a gender lens, it does very much take on this idea of the sort of the unidealization of dharma or the, re the deconstruction and reconstruction of the concept of dharma. And I was, I was hoping that Tim would, um, would want to talk about that. So please, Tim, we turn it over to you. Oh, wow, that was uh, you, uh, more or less summarized my point much better than I could. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna try to answer that, I'm sorry. Well, one of the, if I may, <laughs> one of, the, one of the, the points that Tim makes in his wonderful chapter um, is that in the, this old Kannada Sahasa Bhima Vijaya, the character of Duryodhana really accuses the Pandavas of um, sort of violating these um, what he considers to be the major like precepts of dharma in, in all of these different ways. Um, and, and I think one of the really like huge, like one of the huge points that Tim is making in his paper that I hope you will sort of make after I try to try poorly to summarize it is um, just frankly, just how much, just how much voice and how much volume the author gives to that idea that dharma is a complex thing and can be seen from, from multiple perspectives. Um, so I don't know, Tim, if you want to respond. A little bit, but I don't want to say too much because uh, we're really short on time. Um, we can also call this the last question, but- Oh, no, I don't want to be the last one, please. <laughs> when, you, when you see the band you want to see is third and the people fourth, you don't want to see, it's like not so good. Um, so please don't put me in that position. Uh, I will say um, in, in the in the Canada work I, I've written my dissertation on and uh, trying to finish the last chapter now, as well as in the, this chapter of the book uh, comes from 
certainly uh, Dharma is this, we get a very unique look at it through the lens of Duryodhana, um, where yeah, he accuses the Pandavas of all sorts of uh, atrocities, uh, overstepping it completely. And of course, this is um, a point I make in my dissertation. I don't, I have not put this in writing uh, publicly yet. Um, it's in the title of the text. Sahasa is uh, a word that means many, many things. But one of the long-term meanings of it is uh, excessive force, something that is done sahasa with force. Um, you find this in Dharma Shastra. It's, in, it's indeed, it's, it's a crime you see um, the Vyavaharapadas from a very early period, but it changes what it means over time. Sometimes it's theft, sometimes it's murder, sometimes it's violence. But um, the, the text as a whole, I mean, the way I often render the title and not in this publication for the sake of, I was still working this out at the time that I wrote the chapter, it's Bhima's victory via Sahasa through violent means. Um, even though the Pandavas win, Bhima is crowned king, everything goes what we'd expect, you know, a few differences here and there. Uh, it's really a, a study of how they win through somewhat nefarious means. Um, and then how to lose gracefully <clears throat> when you're the cover of us. Okay, we have a few more questions. I'm gonna kind of summarize them and put them all together in one question so we can bring this to a close. Uh, I have a question. These are questions from Diksha Shivakumar, <clears throat> Naina Shastri, Preeti Ram Prasad, Nagwan Singh and Srinivas Chari again. And I'm gonna summarize them. Uh, Diksha asks uh, if someone could speak to uh, the narrative impulse in South and Southeast Asian literary traditions, traditions that we can say how narratives are composed and disseminated. Uh, Naina is asking, can you tell us more about the gender explorations as seen in the Mahabharata? So anyone can pick up on these when we finish. Uh, Preeti Ramprasad is asking, to what extent does performance contribute to the transformation of text like the one Harshita mentioned? Nagawant Singh has asked, apart from literary and oral tradition of the Mahabharata, what and how music, painting, and performance have contributed to multiplicity of these texts. And the last question will take us from Srinivas Chari again. Do we know which parts of Mahabharata constitute the original Jaya text? So anybody who has any uh, closing comments on any of that broad sort of spectrum of questions can please uh, address any of the points that uh, you think might be relevant. Okay, I think we've covered. I think each of each of these questions could easily spawn another volume. I know they're they're, yeah. they're all very good and very broad, yeah. and uh, it's just an example of how big a topic this is that we're all. I have enjoying an idea. Let, and let's, do in. let's do this again. Let's do this again. Really? Yeah, I, really? I, yeah, I encourage the, those who, for those who ask those questions, thank you, um, especially the performance question. I really like encourage you to look at Harshita's paper, Heidi's paper, um, Paula's paper, Sucheta's paper. Those are very like performance oriented, obviously. And, and Sutha Gopala Krishna's paper. Oh my gosh, well, and so there's a lot, like half of this volume is about performances of the Mahabharata. So um, please, yeah, absolutely check that out. And, you know, if we do a sequel, which we will call Too Many Mahabharatas, Many Mahabharatas <laughs> too, um, <laughs> we do hope that you will join us again. Sorry, back to you, Bob. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I do think we should do this because if ever there was <clears throat> a truly never ending story, it's gotta be the great uh, Bharata. Tale. So I think with that, we're going to have to bring the session to an end. Thank all of the participants uh, for their excellent contributions to this, this uh, ongoing discussion, especially to Nell and Sohiniji for bringing this all up in the form of this conference, wonderful productive conference, which led to this great publication. To Punita and uh, the staff at the uh, Institute for South Asia Studies for staging this terrific event with only few uh, problems on the uh, transmission end. So I say uh, we'll close the session now. Thanks to all and to all a good day or night, wherever you may be. Bye nice now. to see you all. <laughs> you all, thank you so much for Thanks coming. Thanks for coming. Take care, Bye. everybody. Bye-bye. Namo namaha. <laughs>